Good morning, everyone. So when I was in grade three, my class was in a portable classroom behind the school. There were more classes at my elementary school than there were classrooms in the building. And so the school brought in portable classrooms to house the extra classes. But the portable classrooms did not have bathrooms in them. So if you wanted to go to the washroom, you had to walk back to the main school building. And so when I was in grade three, and I have no idea why I did this, whenever I needed to go to the bathroom, I would try to walk back to the school building with my eyes closed. <laughs> I think I had this idea in my head, oh, I wonder what it would like to be blind. I'll try walking to the school to see what happens as if I was blind. I don't know, the mind of a child is a very strange thing. Anyway, what happened every single time was that I would get off course and not end up where I wanted to go. Even though I had walked that path, I don't know, dozens of times, hundreds, I could never get it right with my eyes closed. And that's because, as I'm sure is self-evident to us as adults, when you can't see, you can't understand the world around you or your place in it, you lose track of where you are and what's around you. So this month, we're doing a series on the miracles of Jesus. And I don't know about you, but for me, I find sometimes it's really easy to gloss over the miracle stories. It's easy to think of them as all kind of broadly interchangeable, right? Just the fact that Jesus was a miracle worker proved that he was the promised one in a general sense, right? He was someone with the power of God. And maybe some of them were for fulfilling prophecies. That's kind of important. But, you know, that's, that's about it, right? In this day and age, we tend to pay a lot more attention to the teachings of Jesus, how to live a good life. But actually, the miracle stories can teach us a lot, too. They show us who Jesus is and how we should respond to him. And importantly, they all teach us different things, different parts of who Jesus is and how we should respond to him. They're all uniquely important. Today, we're going to be looking at a story about Jesus healing a blind man in the Gospel of John. And it turns out this story is about more than just literal blindness. It also reveals the ways in which we are spiritually blind. Blind to the truth about God, blind to the truth about ourselves, and blind to the truth about the world around us. But before we get into that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing us together here this morning to hear your word for us today. Open our hearts and our minds to receive it. Open our eyes to see you at work. Lord, I pray that through your message today, you would help people see the truth about you in their lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So you might remember from my sermon on Jesus turning water into wine that John has a really unique way of presenting the miracle stories. He never, he never actually calls them miracles. He calls them signs. And as a quick refresher for anyone who was not here for that sermon, a sign is something that points beyond itself. So if you're driving along and you see this road sign, you know that it means yield to oncoming traffic. In literal terms, it's just a red and white triangle. It doesn't have yield written on it. It doesn't have a picture of yielding. But when you see it, you know that you need to yield. The sign communicates something beyond itself. And so it's the same thing with the signs in John. They tell us things beyond the literal events of the story. In addition to being a miracle, a sign is a metaphor for a deeper truth. The miracle we're going to look at today is the sixth of the seven signs in the Gospel of John. So let's take a look at it. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
So the disciples' question here springs from a way of looking at the world that never really seems to go away. It was around in the disciples' day, it was around in Old Testament times, and it continues to be around today. In biblical times, it was called retribution theology. Nowadays, we might call it the prosperity gospel. The basic idea is that you get what you deserve. If you're a good person, you'll be blessed. But if you're a bad person, you'll be cursed. If you follow God and obey his commands, you'll be healthy and wealthy. But if you stray from God and you sin, you'll lose your money and your wealth. And if you take this as an ironclad rule, as the disciples were, then people who are blessed must be good people, and people who are cursed must be bad people. If someone is wealthy and prosperous, they must be righteous. They earned it. But if someone is sick or poor, it's because they've sinned and they're getting what they deserve. And if you cherry-pick verses from the Bible, you can make it look like the Bible supports this line of thinking. But the Bible teaches this as a general guideline, not an ironclad rule. Yes, generally, it is more profitable to do good. That will usually lead you to better outcomes. But sometimes, bad things just happen to people who don't deserve it. And sometimes, people who do bad things get away with it. So one example of this in the Bible is the story of Job. The story opens with this verse. In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. The man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. So Job was blameless and upright. He was a model follower of God. And yet, he still loses everything. His house is destroyed in a storm. His livestock is carried away by thieves. And he's afflicted with a terrible sickness. And Job's friends, heavy air quotes around friends, show up and they say, hey, Job, clearly you've done something wrong, right? Or God would not have done all this to you. You need to repent if you want God to give you your health and your wealth back. But Job hasn't done anything wrong. And he knows he, doesn't have any, doesn't, <clears throat> he knows he hasn't done anything wrong. And so he stands firm and asserts his innocence. Sometimes bad things do happen to people who don't deserve it. The story of Job is a rejection of retribution theology. But the disciples couldn't see this. They were blind to the way the world really works. And so Jesus, knowing all this, corrects the disciples. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But so that the works of God might be displayed in him, we must do the work of him who sent me as long as it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. So before we go any further, there's something that I want to address, and that is the translation, because this verse is a bit controversial, we'll say. So some Bible translations have the following. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must do the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. And I'm sure you can see how that's kind of troubling. It, it implies that God caused the man to be born blind, and by extension, caused all the other problems in the man's life. Because he was blind, he couldn't work. And so if God caused the man's blindness, he also caused the man's poverty. But that's not the only way to translate these verses. The original Greek manuscripts of the Bible were written without punctuation. In the ancient world, Paper was very valuable, and so people would write without punctuation to save space and therefore save paper. And so the original Greek manuscript just read, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but so that the works of God might be displayed in him, we must do the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. And so I'm sure you can see how that's kind of ambiguous. It's not totally clear where the first sentence stops and the second sentence starts. And so if we punctuate this string of words a little differently, we get what I read earlier. Neither this man nor his parents sinned. But so that the works of God might be displayed in him, we must do the works of him who sent me as long as it is day. And I hope you can see that this makes a little more sense now. Instead of implying that God caused the man to be born blind, these verses instead become about the importance of doing the work of God. 
If you remember my sermon about Jesus walking on water, I talked about how God does not cause the storms in our lives, but the storms in our lives are an opportunity to see God at work. The same kind of thing is being communicated here. The man didn't cause the man's blindness, or sorry, God didn't cause the man's blindness, but his blindness is an opportunity to do something good. Now, Jesus says we need to do the works of God as long as it is day, and that night is coming when no one can work. That kind of sounds a little weird at first, like Jesus can only do miracles while the sun is shining, but it's actually a case of Jesus speaking metaphorically, as he often does in the Gospel of John. In this case, day refers to Jesus' time on earth, and night refers to his crucifixion. Basically, what Jesus is saying is, I'm only here for a limited amount of time. Pretty soon I'm gonna get nailed to a cross and die, and I'm not gonna be doing a whole lot of healing at that point. The work of God needs to be done while the opportunity exists to do it. If we waste time debating about why this man is blind, we're gonna miss the opportunity to do something good for him. He's trying to get the disciples out of their current way of thinking so they can see the opportunity right in front of them to do good. And then Jesus goes on to say, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus as the light of the world is one of the most important metaphors in the Gospel of John. It's one that John uses a lot. And to understand what it means, you just need to think about what light does in our everyday lives. Light lets us see things. It lets us understand the world around us. Without light, we can't figure out where we're going or how to get there. It's the same with Jesus. Jesus lets us see and understand things clearly. Things about God, about the world around us, and about ourselves. Without Jesus, we're spiritually blind. We can't see the truth about God or about ourselves. And when we can't see the truth, we don't know where we are or where we're going. And in the same way that Jesus is about to heal this man's literal blindness, he also heals our spiritual blindness. Jesus is the light by which we see the truth. So after saying this, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man that used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. So the man has been healed, and those who knew him can scarcely believe that it's him. They're not even sure that it's the same guy. It should be the same with us when Jesus gives us the light to see the truth. When we understand the truth about God and about ourselves and about the world around us, it should cause us to act differently. When we can really see ourselves, we can see that maybe we're angry or prideful or greedy, and we can see that we need to change. And when we can really see God, we can see where he is and what he's doing in the world. We can see and understand the way that God moves and the way that he works. And when we can really see the world around us, we can understand what we need to do, the opportunities we have to help the people around us. The problem with the disciples was that they couldn't see properly. In time, they would come to understand. Eventually, they would be the ones who spread the message of Jesus after Jesus went back to heaven. But at this point, they didn't see and understand the way the world worked. When they saw the blind man, they didn't see an opportunity to help him. They just wanted to know who was responsible for the man's blindness so they could write him off. Unfortunately, the man's neighbors also don't see or understand. And so they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. 
Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, well, this man clearly is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs? So they were divided. Like the disciples, the Pharisees also couldn't see. They were also too wrapped up in their particular way of seeing the world. Now, if you remember from my sermon on Jesus turning water into wine, I talked a bit about the problem with the Pharisees. They were obsessed with the law. The problem wasn't the law itself, though. The law was supposed to point people towards God and help them live fulfilled lives. That's why God gave the Israelites the law all the way back at the start of the biblical story. But that's not how the Jews of the first century thought about the law. For the Jews of the first century, the law had become an end unto itself. And to that end, the Pharisees had added human laws around God's laws in order to really guarantee that God's laws would not be broken. And one of the ways that they had done this was they had strictly defined what kinds of activities were and weren't allowed on the Sabbath. They were so obsessed with keeping the letter of the law that they had forgotten the spirit of the law. Now, Jesus is way more interested in the spirit of the law. He understands that if the letter of the law ever gets in the way of pointing people to God, the letter of the law needs to go in order to fulfill the spirit of the law. That's why Jesus healed the man, even though it was the Sabbath. In healing the man, Jesus was fulfilling the purpose of the law, even though he was breaking the letter of the law. Or more accurately, the letter of the human laws that the, Pharisee, <clears throat> that the Pharisees had put around God's laws. But the Pharisees, they don't understand this. Because they refuse to see by the light of Jesus, they can't see at all because they're so wrapped up in the worldview that they already have, they can't understand what's going on right in front of them. After this, there's an exchange between the man and the Pharisees that's quite long and mostly goes in circles, so I won't read it all out for you here. It's really hot today and I don't wanna keep you too long. But in summary, the Pharisees try to convince the man that Jesus can't possibly be sent by God but the man refuses to budge. Because Jesus healed his blindness, both literally and spiritually, the man can now see that Jesus is the Messiah, the promised one. But because the Pharisees are blind to the truth, in the end, they throw him out of the synagogue. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I might believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you right now. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Until this moment, the man didn't actually know what Jesus looked like. Jesus had sent him away to the pool to wash, and that was where the man had been healed. He was already away from Jesus when his sight had been restored. But because Jesus had also healed the man's spiritual blindness, as soon as he knew that the person he was talking to was the person who had healed him, he knew that he was speaking to the Messiah. The disciples were blind to the way the world worked, and the Pharisees couldn't see the heart of the law. But this man saw and understood. Because he had his spiritual blindness healed by Jesus, he understood who Jesus was. It is only by the light of Jesus that we can really see and understand the truth. If you really want to understand the truth about God, about yourself, and about the world around you, you need to look by the light of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for being the light in our lives. Thank you that you reveal to us the truth about you, about ourselves, and about the world around us. 
Lord, when we are too wrapped up in our own way of seeing things, help us to see the truth by your light. Help us to live differently according to that truth. All of this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.